Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ulysses Baltazar. I am a vascular surgeon here in Houston. Today we are going to run the venal lymphatic module. This is the first time that we put the two of them together and try to make it one, and you'll see why. So uh, we are going to run kind of a nice and smoothly without getting too deep into this, but getting the, enough information that will help you during your uh, fellowship. The venal lymphatic system, uh, in the past you know, 10 years or so, it's been a very, very pu a big push by the vascular society and the lymphatic societies to actively merge the lymphatic system into the circulatory system for obvious reasons that we'll see here. But let's start first with the, uh, where the, everything comes from. Venous embryology, uh, the, the venous embryology, I know, I'm sure everybody remembers uh, how the venous system is formed. Uh, from your med school, but let's do a quick refreshment here. And uh, everything happens between the four and the six week period for the for the venous system, and begins with you know two three pairs of veins, the cardinal veins, uh, four pairs of veins, the cardinal veins, the umbilical veins, and the vital veins. And then we have the primordial heart on top. To get, this is just obviously a drawing a picture, but to have a concept for people that have trouble to look where this goes, this probably will help you and summarizes where, in general, where the veins might come from, in general. So when you have a question, you know, you have an idea where these come from. And of course, we have, obviously, this, this, is, this is the pair of veins that I was mentioning. These are the anterior cardinal veins, posterior cardinal veins, one side and the other the umbilical veins and the vital veins. So, for example, the, the, from the chest up, neck and arms, everything is going to be derived from the cardinal veins, the anterior cardinal veins, one and two, all the way carotid, the, I mean the jugular and uh, uh, brachiocephalic trunk, etc., all the way to the arms. And then the posterior cardinal veins go all the way down and to the limbs, and with a combination of the vital veins, they are going to form the abdominal part and those, we are going to have uh, the vena cava, for example, the superior vena cava uh, is going to be formed by the following branches in the, in the, uh, the brachiocephalic veins and the right atrium. They help fuse and form the superior vena cava. Uh, we are going to see where the brachiocephalic part comes from. Uh, the proximal part of the inferior vena cava is the right vital vein. Then a series of cardinal and subcardinal veins continue all the way distal, all the way to the most distal segment of the cardinal veins that are going to form the iliac system. So, but once you see the previous picture, you can, you can see this in your head and have a general concept where the veins are coming from. And, you know, you can answer almost always correctly when uh, somebody asks you, you know, want to be smart, nobody is going, but if somebody asks you where do you think this vein is coming from, you might have a pretty good idea. So, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, uh, the brachiocephalic trunks are coming basically from the anterior cardinal vein. The right anterior, in this case, form the two of them, and then uh, with the right atrium, they are going to form the spirina cava. Now, the pulmonary artery is going to be formed by the left atrium and the pulmonary venous plexus. Another vein here, I divide it in segments so it's not be that crowded. So it's going to be the portal vein that is going to be the uh, distal right vital vein. The uh, azygos vein is going to be formed by the right branch of the supracardinal vein. And as I mentioned already three times, all the, from the chest up, the cardinal veins are going to be responsible to forming all the uh, jugular, brachial, brachiocephalic, menominate, all that kind of stuff in order to get into the spirina cava. Now, the first vein in the fetus that appears that persist all the way to adulthood. That might be one of those three questions that people like to ask, especially in the test, is the lesser saphenous vein. The short saphenous vein that is a branch that is formed by the lateral marginal vein is the first vein that appears uh, in the fetus that persist all the way to adulthood. The greater saphenous vein and, super, and uh, deep system uh, it's going to be formed by a combination of angioguiding nerves and undifferentiated vascular <laughs> plexus. So this is a general. In the same way, we are going to see some general anomalies. So venous anomalies, the duplication of vena cava, normally is a distal beyond the renals and is, uh, is, is lateral obviously on the left side. And it's going to be a persistent left sacro cardinal vein 
that is going to drain into the left renal vein, from the left iliac to the left renal. But still, that was a question I remember somewhere. The, the uh, left gonadal vein still drains into this duplication. Uh, the uh, absence of a absence of a superior, uh, inferior vena cava is just partial abscess and normally is from the renals up. And what is going to happen is the right sub uh, cardinal vein is going to bypass the liver and it's going to join the, uh, the azigos vein and that's how it's going to drain into the superior vena cava. This is a posterior view of the heart. As you can see, the nice artistic skills. So it's posterior and we are going to have a left-sided superior vena cava and that is because persistent of the left uh, cardinal vein and a duplication of the superior vena cava is going to be persistent left anterior cardinal vein. These are just bits. You can, you, just to memorize in case you have this question somewhere, you have a good idea of how to answer. As we know, the anatomy, you know that from first year of medical school, the arterial and veins are different because the layers they have. Uh, the thickness, and one more uh, characteristic, the valves. And the, now, one, one thing you need to know is which veins in the body don't have any valves. Any ideas, suggestions? All the veins in the body have valves, every single one of them? No. I guess it's Sunday morning, so I'll give you that. So veins without valves are those in the list there. Solial sinuses is one of the distal veins that doesn't have valves uh, in the area that normally are valves present, but if they are absent. And then the central veins, you know, in starting from the internal iliac or common iliac, cava, subclavia, innominate, and the external iliac vein, just 25% of the time have valves. So, this is going to go fast because it's just a brief re uh, reminder of the anatomy, of the vein, the vein anatomy. We are not going to go branch by branch, but obviously the jugular system is important in the neck. You are going to use it several times, so quite often in your career in order to gain some access in patients that require central lines. And what is important about this is, you know, doesn't matter because you are accessing the jugular vein in the neck, you can reach still the tip of the, the tip of the uh, pleura and get a pneumothorax, so you need to be careful. Uh, it's a rich network that is draining all the face and, um, and the intracranial part uh, into the jugular. The arm mostly is superficial, distal to the elbow. Yes, there are some deep veins next to the radial and ulnar artery. There are a couple of veins traveling with, with, with the arteries, but it's mostly superficial. And it's going to go, base, the two basic vessels, the cephalic, that is going to the, the polar aspect of the forearm, and the basilic, that is medial, and they are more evident proximal. Now, the, uh, the, the basilic vein is going to join the brachial vein, which forms at the level of the elbow by the junction of the deep veins. And is going to join somewhere in this area here, and that's important because you are when you do uh, dialysis access and you do a basilic vein transposition, then you need to know where this ends in order to do the loop, make the loop, and don't make an angle in that area, so the access might be useful. The cephalic vein drains into the um, uh, ac uh, axillary vein to uh, it, right at the junction of the, of the uh, axillary vein, so drains into and joins the uh, internal jugular vein to form the uh, innominate artery on that side. So the central view, what I was mentioning to you is when you get access, in access for the right jugular vein in order to put a central line, you know, the tip of the lung is real close. So don't think because you are going to the neck and non, and not subclavian uh, access is gonna be uh, free of risk, is never free of risks. The abdomen, the typical uh, picture that we saw many times in med school, the uh, left, um, the left renal vein is going to be the superior landmark for when we repair infrarenal uh, aneurysms. And what happens when the angle of the superior mesenteric artery is too short and or too 
too acute and occludes part of the left renal vein. What happens? I'm sorry? Not quite. That's not cracker syndrome. That is going to compress the left renal vein and it's going to uh, increase pressure on the left gonadal vein and it's going to go all the way to the left ovarian vein and give symptoms to the patient. So this is the not cracker syndrome, which is very complex. It's not that easy. Mechanically, it looks very easy. You know, the superior mesenteric artery is going to be compressing the left renal vein. We need to stand the renal vein, renal, renal, left renal vein. When, guess what happens when you do that? Some of the time, nothing happens. The patient is still asymptomatic. So it's one of those uh, syndromes that require a lot of thinking and patient selection that you see later on in life. Uh, the, uh, the portal system, you know, formed by the superior uh, mesenteric vein as well as the splenic vein, and 25-30% the inferior mesenteric vein joined right at the angle. And the importance of this, obviously, is the junction of the gas gastroesophageal veins that are going to, well, I mean, no, it's, not, it's not the name of the vein, but it's the system that is going to drain into the portal system Then, when we have cirrhosis and increase in the portal pressure is going to reflect in varicosities in the esophagus. And all the symptoms that uh, come with it. The lower extremity, the superficial system, the uh, greater saphenous vein is going to start just anterior to the medial malleolar area and is going to run medial to the leg, just posterior to the knee, and then comes back anterior to drain into the uh, uh, femoral vein. The, uh, I'm sorry, the other way. The lesser saphenous vein is going to drain the lateral aspect of the of the leg and is going to drain into the popliteal vein just behind the knee. The important thing about the lesser saphenous vein when you do ablations, and I guess uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit today, is you need to start the ablation. When you're, not, when we're, when you're going to use thermal energy to close the lesser saphenous vein, we need to start this uh, proximal to the gastrocnemius muscle because the sural nerve is right there distal to it and carries 3 to 5 percent chances to get the nerve and then you're going to give that patient numbness in the lateral aspect of the lower leg, and they're not happy about that. Or if you don't, didn't mention that to them, and you ended up having that, they are even less happy about that. Approximately, as I was mentioning, the greater saphenous vein drains into the common femoral vein, along with other branches that are important, especially when you are doing vein surgery. You know, the epigastric vein, the circumflex, and the pudendal branches drain into this area that you need to make sure you dissect and ligate, because otherwise, if the common femoral vein is incompetent and that is not corrected by the greater saphenous vein ablation, the pressure is going to go to those branches, and now they are going to have varicosities in the lower abdomen, as well as in the interior aspect of the thigh. Proximal, the internal iliac vein, as you know, drains mo all the pelvis, uh, pelvis all and, and its contents, and is the source of a lot of issues in our patients, drains into the external iliac and form the common iliac veins to form the vena cava. Rapidly, the uh, lymphatic embryology in six weeks, about two weeks after the cardiovascular system is formed, you start seeing diverticula, uh, there, is, there are sacs that are start being evident in the, in the, in the embryo, and they are going to develop into the lymphatic system. There are two theories. Where do they come from? Diverticula of the endothelium in the veins or mesenchyma connected to the venous system. Either way, it's connected to the venous system, so they are very close related. And that's why one of the many reasons why we are trying to put the venolymphatic uh, concept. Uh, week six at nine, the two jugular sacs at the junction of the subclavian vein and the anterior cardinal vein. There are six, basically, two jugular, two iliac, one retroperitoneal, and one big dilatation in the abdomen that is going to be the sterna chile. All the mesenchymal cells form the lymph nodes. They're going to form the lymph nodes. What constitutes the uh, uh, lymphatic anatomy? Well, the obvious, the obvious components, but don't forget about the tonsils, payer patches, patches, and spleen, and liver in the fetus. Uh, the anatomy, and we are going to go over that a little bit later in the uh, physiology of the lymphatics. So, uh, we'll go over this uh, anatomy later, so don't try to memorize all that stuff, and I will go one by one when we see how they work. Um, it's a rich, vast system that we often ignore and that we have, or I have, become to learn painfully 
because we don't think about it. It's like the stepchild that goes to every party with you and you don't forgot about his coming with you and, and then shows up and start throwing up in the middle of the party. And like, nobody told me about this. So is, is, is the way I, became, I, I came to learn about lymphatic and on my own. So you need to, uh, my advice is be aware because it's gonna come and bite you in places that you might not like. So, and uh, initially, it was thought, it's, it's funny how we say, you know, we thought, I never did any research, so I don't know, people thought that they were not, the lymphatics were not in the nervous system, every, every part in the body but the nervous system, but it's, it's false. This is a picture of endocyanin in green, and we'll talk about that later, about the lymphatics in the brain. So they do exist. Now, the important thing are the trunks that we have with the lymphatic system. And because this cartoon that I bought on the internet didn't have it, I need to I draw it here, as you can see very nicely. The right and left lumbar trunks are gonna drain the entire lower system, and they're gonna merge in one and then form the cisterna chile and then the thoracic duct. That's gonna be your nemesis when you do neck surgery or thoracic surgery. Uh, and then in the upper body, obviously the jugular and subclavian trunks that are gonna drain uh, into the, in the junction of the internal jugular and the subclavian vein, that's where the lymphatic drains into the venous system. As you know and you remember from your, your anatomy, the right, the, the, the left side, the, the left thor the thoracic duct is gonna drain the entire body except the right chest, neck, face, arm and torso. And that is gonna drain to the right lymphatic duct. And the, there are watersheds, ooh, didn't show here, I don't know why. That's when you do your stuff in Keynote and then you put it in PowerPoint. Anyway, there are watersheds, there are areas of low cir circulation between the lymphatics that you need to know when you treat uh, lymphedema patients. So in, in summary, it's a vast, system that you need to be aware of so you live happily after ever after. And that's the that's it for anatomy of the venal lymphatic system. Any questions? No? Great. So guess what?